Okay, so we are already in the YouTube. So we going to, we we're going to start this lecture. It is a pleasure for us to have uh, Professor William Phillips from NIST in the United States. Everybody knows Bill, as he is called. Bill is a uh, one of the main scientists involved in the development of laser cooling. Uh, for atoms in the beginning, but today they use for many things, and was the, let's say, the entrance door to really go for physics near the absolute zero, uh, where many things happen. In low temperature, as we learn in quantum mechanics, uh, the wave uh, manifestation is fantastic, and uh, one of the effects that uh, can be reached in the low temperature is the Bose condensation for a non-dense sample. And uh, since the very beginning of uh, the, the experiments of Bill, uh, everybody was envisioned that eventually we could uh, reach quantum degeneracy, which is having a sample of gas that normally is a classical gas in a quantum regime. And we all know that that should give it to us properties that we will learn a lot. And that was a fact. When we produced Bose condensate in the lab, we realized how powerful was the techniques to prepare the sample before reaching the condensation. And, uh, and Bill is uh, basically the main actor in this whole field. And of course, he got Nobel Prize because of his, the importance of his work. And uh, in our course, uh, we are learning the principles of uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, but also we are learning the principles involved to produce the Bose-Einstein condensation. And uh, nobody better than Bill Phillips to tell us the principles, how things were done, and uh, where can we go. So, Bill, thank you very much for accepting, giving this uh, lecture in this uh, uh, summer course. It's summer in Brazil. Students are in vacation, except some groups taking summer course. So, thank you very much. You can start your lecture. I just want to say that uh, we are broadcasting the YouTube, and somebody's falling. If you have a question, if you are falling from the YouTube and have a question, send us a shot. And then uh, we will, at the end, ask uh, questions to Bill that came from the audience outside the auditorium, okay? So, Bill, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I wish I were there, but uh, I want to emphasize, please ask questions, uh, uh, raise your hand, and uh, Vanderlei will pass along the question to me. Uh, okay. So... Um, this talk is going to be about uh, laser cooling, also about trapping and Bose-Einstein condensation. And um, one of the questions uh, that comes up naturally is, why do we want to do this? Well, the original motivation for doing laser cooling was uh, atomic clocks. And I would say that it's perhaps today the most important practical application that uh, people have for laser cooling. I'm not going to talk about atomic clocks, but I'm happy to answer questions about them if you want. Uh, suffice it to say that the atomic clocks work better when the atoms aren't going really, really fast. It's a lot easier to measure things when they're going more slowly, and that's the key reason why we want to, uh, uh, to cool uh, atomic gases. But today, the scientific activity... Uh, as opposed to the practical applications. The scientific activity uh, has created a whole new field of cold atom physics and uh, quantum degenerate gases, for example, Bose-Einstein condensates, are a major part of that activity. And much of the current work in atomic, molecular, and optical physics is done with cold atoms. So these are, are some of the reasons why we want to study these things. So let me just define a few terms. When I say laser cooling, what I mean is using lasers to reduce the velocity spread of a thermal gas of atoms. Uh, trapping uh, 
means electromagnetic trapping. It means confining atoms using laser fields or other electromagnetic fields, usually uh, magnetic fields. Now, I want to point out that there are a lot of ways of cooling things, but the ordinary ways that we might cool things, that is, put them in contact with something else that's cool, the usual kinds of refrigeration, are simply not going to work with gases because these gases will condense at um, uh, temperatures that are much too high to be useful for the kinds of things that we want to do. So let's begin by talking about the way in which uh, light can exert forces on atoms. So radiative forces or the mechanical effects of light fall into two categories, the scattering force and the dipole force. So what are these? So imagine an atom, uh, and this atom, uh, I'm going to simplify it and imagine that it's got two energy levels, a ground state and an excited state. I shine a laser beam in to the atom uh, that is resonant with the transition from the ground to the excited state. That means the energy of each photon, h bar omega, is equal to the energy difference between the ground and the excited state. Every time an atom absorbs a photon and therefore goes to the excited state, it gets a kick equal to the momentum of the photon. And the momentum is Planck's constant divided by uh, the wavelength of the light. And we can also write that as h bar uh, times k, where k is, is 2 pi over uh, over the wavelength. Uh, we sometimes call k the wave vector or the magnitude of the wave vector. So the atom, after having absorbed the photon, will re-radiate the photon. And it does that in a random direction. So the average force that the atom uh, feels is the rate of change of its momentum. And its momentum uh, is h bar k for each photon. So if I multiply that quantity by the rate of scattering photons, that gives me the force. The average force is equal to the momentum of, of a photon times the rate of scattering. Now, the, um, I emphasize this is the average force. There is also momentum transferred to the atom when it radiates the photons. But because it radiates in a random direction, that averages to zero. So the average force on the atom is this quantity that I've written here, because the spontaneous emissions uh, average to zero. That doesn't mean that they're not important but it means that the average force doesn't have any contribution from the spontaneous emissions. Okay, so that's what we often call the scattering force. Sometimes it's just called radiation pressure. Uh, the other kind of force is called the dipole force, Some, sometimes also called uh, uh, the, uh, the stimulated force or the gradient force. This occurs when an atom absorbs a photon from one laser beam and is stimulated to emit a photon into another laser beam. So here it's absolutely essential to have this kind of a force that you have more than one laser beam. A, a, a plane wave, for example, is not going to exert any dipole force on an atom because there's only one momentum of the photon. What we require is that the atom absorb a photon of one momentum and then be stimulated to emit a photon of a different momentum. The difference between those two momenta is the momentum that is um, given to the atom. And if it's a plane wave, then there's no difference between those two momenta and there won't be any dipole force. And I guess I drew this uh, uh, circle around uh, these things to emphasize the energy of the photon being h bar omega, the momentum of the photon being h bar k, which is the same as h over lambda. Okay, now just as an aside, usually it's easy to distinguish uh, scattering force from dipole force, but there are some cases where it's a little bit ambiguous whether you want to call it one or the, the other. This doesn't mean that there's any ambiguity to try to figure out what the actual final force is, it's just a matter of what we name it. But it does mean you have to be careful to make sure you don't double count. So that's just a warning. Probably not something that you're going to encounter. Now, let's uh, let's do some actual calculations. Uh, the force, as we saw before, is equal to the rate of scattering times h bar k, the, the momentum of a single photon. What is that rate? This is 
the equation for the rate of scattering of a two-level atom. Uh, remember, for almost all of these things, I'm making the simplification that the atom is a two-level atom. It's got a ground state. It's got an excited state. When it absorbs a photon, it goes from the ground state to the excited state. When it's in the excited state, it decays. And the rate at which it decays, we call gamma. Now, what is the rate of absorption? It's gamma over 2 times this Lorentzian line shape. In the uh, numerator, I have the intensity of the laser. Not surprising, because the stronger the laser is, the more uh, photons I'm going to absorb per unit time. And in the denominator, I have this, uh, this Lorentzian uh, line width that um, uh, uh, says that as the detuning from resonance, what is the detuning? It's the difference between the laser frequency and what I call the natural frequency, which is the energy difference between ground and excited state divided by Planck's constant, or divided by h-bar. So that frequency difference is the detuning, and uh, uh, that uh, detuning sets the line width of the... Um, I'm sorry, that, that detuning gives you the shape of the uh, of the resonance curve. It's a Lorentzian. I'll sort of draw it like that. And uh, the line width of that Lorentzian is given by gamma, the decay rate. And uh, and delta, the detuning, is what I'm imagining here along the uh, uh, the horizontal axis. So I have a, a, a curve like that. And it's a Lorentzian in shape. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that in the denominator, I also have the intensity. This term here is uh, responsible for what we call saturation. If I increase the intensity so that it's very big, then uh, the denominator is going to be dominated by this term. And the numerator has the same term. So that means when the intensity is very big, this expression goes to 1, and the rate of scattering goes to gamma over 2. That's the biggest that the scattering rate can ever be, half of the decay rate. And why is that? It's because you end up with half of the population in the excited state. If you crank up the power more, it just drives population down into the ground state. And so in steady state, you can never have more than half the population in the excited state. And that's why the, um, the scattering rate is limited to gamma over 2. Uh, so I also want to tell you that gamma, the decay rate, is equal to the full width at half max of this Lorentzian curve that I'm sort of drawing out here, measured in radians per second, okay? Um, oh, let's not talk about the Rabi frequency. We've got too many things to talk about. Okay, so that is what you need to know to understand the scattering force or the radiation pressure force. Let's talk about the dipole force. So I'm going to give you two different ways of thinking about the dipole force. Uh, the energy of, of a dipole, an electric dipole, uh, placed into an electric field is given by minus mu dot e, where mu is the, uh, is the dipole moment. Now let's imagine that the electric field is an oscillating electric field, as it is when I uh, shine a laser on the atom. So that means the electric field has this, this functional form, some... Uh, some number, uh, E, which is a vector, times cosine of omega t. Now, the atom doesn't have a permanent dipole moment, but when I apply an electric field, it induces a, a dipole moment onto the atom. And the uh, if I apply a an oscillating electric field, like from a laser, then I'm going to get an oscillating uh, dipole moment. I can think of that oscillating dipole moment as being some kind of a displacement of the uh, electron with, uh, in the atom. An electron has, has charge E times uh, how far it's displaced, which I've written here as X. So this is my sort of imagination of what the dipole moment of the atom is, that the electrons in the atom are displaced by an amount given by X. And now I'm going to make an assumption, which is not true, but is good enough, as long as I uh, make certain uh, approximations, that the electron in the atom is harmonically bound. Uh, 
We often make this kind of an assumption because we understand how to deal with harmonic oscillators. You've probably solved the equations of motion for a driven harmonic oscillator in your undergraduate classes. And the result of that is that if you drive a harmonic oscillator at a certain frequency, then it will respond at that frequency. And here's the equation of motion for the harmonic oscillator. You've probably seen this before. And then if you solve it, Solve, solve what the, uh, the motion of the harmonic oscillator is, then it's some amplitude that's proportional to how strongly you're driving it. It, it uh, responds at this frequency that you're driving it, and it's got a denominator that goes to zero when the resonant frequency um, uh, is equal to the driving frequency. Now, that's because I've ignored losses, but the point that I want to make is that if I drive it off resonance, and if the driving frequency is lower, that's what is lower than the resonant frequency, okay, so I'm driving it slower than the resonant frequency, then just plugging that in, the dipole, uh, induced dipole moment is going to be in the same um, phase as the, uh, as the driving field, and the energy is going to be proportional to the negative of the square of the electric field. Now, the square of the electric field is the, the power of the laser. It's proportional to the power of the laser. So that means the energy is proportional to the power or the intensity of the laser light, but with a negative sign, if the uh, frequency is below the resonant frequency. But if the frequency is above the resonant frequency, then you're going to get a negative sign. The um, uh, the, the dipole moment will be 180 degrees out of phase with the driving field. And so when you apply that negative sign to the energy, the energy is positive, and now the, the energy is, uh, is a positive number proportional to the intensity of the light. What does this mean? It means if I've got a light field that has a variable intensity varying in space, that if the frequency of the laser is below the resonant frequency, the atoms will be attracted to the place where the intensity is highest. But if the frequency is higher than the resonant frequency, then the atoms will be repelled from the place where the energy is highest. Okay, so that's very important, that if you're below resonance, the atoms are attracted to the place where the intensity is highest. If you're above resonance, they're repelled from the place where the res where the um, in intensity is highest. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it. There's another way of thinking about it, which gives you the same answer, but I'm just going to go through it very briefly because it's so beautiful. Uh, this was a, a, a perspective that was invented by uh, Claude Cohen Tanuji, uh, with whom uh, I shared the Nobel Prize in, in 1997. And he and his colleague Jean Dalibar. Uh, figured out all kinds of wonderful things about the way atoms and lasers behave, uh, and their their paper on it is a real classic. But anyway, here's the idea. Here's an atom, a two-level atom. It's got a ground state and an excited state, and that's the energy level diagram. Now, I also want to think about what is the energy of the light. Now, the light has a frequency omega, which I've said here, omega L for omega laser, and I've drawn the energy level diagram so that omega laser is a little bit bigger than omega naught, the uh, the frequency corresponding to the energy difference between the two uh, uh, the two states of the atom. Okay, now what does this energy level diagram mean? Well, if I've got n photons, there's a certain number, there's a certain energy in the light field, and I can put my zero of energy any place I want. That's a choice that I can make. So I'm going to make n photons have the same energy as the atom in the ground state. So I just draw it to be the same as the energy in the ground state. But remember, this is a different energy level diagram. This is the one for the laser. This is the one for the atom. I just make them the same. I can call this my zero. Um, and then you see the first excited state of the laser is a little bit above the excited state of the, of the atom. And there's a whole ladder of, uh, of states, both above and below uh, this state, depending upon whether I've got more than n photons or fewer than n photons. Now, 
Here's the trick. I'm going to combine these two things. I'm going to give one energy level diagram that is the sum of the energy of these two uh, things, namely the atom and the, the light field. So here, at the same energy level, I've got the atom in its ground state with n photons. And at a little bit lower in energy is the atom in the excited state with n minus 1 photons. Okay? So it means I go up in energy by omega naught, and I go down in energy by omega laser. So the excited state is a little bit lower than the ground state with when it has n minus 1 photons. Now, I go up here, and I find that uh, just uh, omega laser above this ground state, I've got the excited state. I'm sorry. I've got the ground state with n plus 1 photons. So from here to here is omega laser. But from here to here, the ground state with n photons to the excited state with n photons, that's omega naught or omega atom. Okay? So it's just combining these two things together. And what it gives me is, again, a whole ladder of energy levels according to how many photons they are. But each one of those ladders has two, each one of those, those rungs in the ladder is um, is two different states that have an energy difference that's equal to the detuning of the laser from resonance. But at the moment, I'm still thinking about the atom and the laser field as being separate things. I haven't yet considered that they will interact with each other, but of course they do. If the atom is in the laser field, they interact. And what happens when I've got two energy levels and I turn on an interaction the two energy levels go apart. This is a general feature in quantum mechanics, and you, if you haven't learned it already, you you soon will, uh, that whenever you solve the uh, the two-by-two two, uh, matrix equation for, for what's going on here, you find that the new energy levels are a little bit further apart than, um, uh, than they were before you allowed them to interact. And uh, how far apart they are is, it's the square root of the detuning squared plus uh, uh, what we call the Rabi frequency squared. And I wish now I'd said more about the Rabi frequency earlier, but the Rabi frequency is uh, a number that's proportional to the strength of the electric field and to how strongly the laser interacts with the atoms. So the, um, uh, the matrix elements that, uh, that connect the ground and excited state. So this separation is always bigger than the detuning. Now, how did we get from here to the dipole force? Imagine a laser field that has its highest intensity at some place, which I'm going to call zero, and it falls off like a Gaussian as you go away. This is very common for laser fields that they look like this. Well, if the atom is in a laser field like that, then one of the grounds, one of the, the, the dress states is going to go up in um, uh, in energy as you go into the laser field, and the other one is going to go down. And if the uh, detuning is higher than zero, then the atoms are going to be mainly in this upper state, and the the net uh, average effect is going to be to repel the atoms. But when the atoms when the laser frequency is below zero, the population tends to be in this lower state and the net effect is that the atoms are uh, are drawn into this, the place of highest intensity which is exactly the situation that we got when we thought of the atom like a harmonic oscillator and so if you've got a really big detuning which is the way we usually do things today then the lower state is mostly ground state it's got a little bit of excited state mixed in that's what changes the energy level and the amount by which its energy is lower than the um, uh, uh, than the energy of the uh, uh, of the pure ground state is the Rabi frequency squared divided by four times the uh, of the detuning. This is what we call the light shift, and uh, it is in fact the potential that can trap an atom. So this is how we trap atoms with lasers. We tune the laser very far from resonance, we shine the laser on the atom, and the atom is drawn into the place where the laser has its maximum intensity. Uh, 
And this idea of being tuned very far from resonance is the way we usually work. So here's a picture of how it works. Here's a laser beam being focused by say a lens right here at the focus. The intensity of the laser is maximum. If I move in this direction or in this direction, the intensity will go down. So right here at the focus is the place of maximum intensity. And that's where the atom is drawn to. And uh, usually it's hard to focus the atom, uh, the laser beam very, very strongly. So often what we will do is add another laser beam so that the trapping, which has to do with how much of a gradient of the intensity we have, uh, it's very strong in this direction, perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So when we have two laser beams crossing, it's strong in all directions. So those are two different ways of thinking about the dipole force. The dipole force is very important because it's one of the main ways in which we trap atoms. And when we make a Bose condensate, we always have to trap the atoms in some way. And this is one of the main ways in which we do it. So. I'm going to stop here and see if any of you have thought of some questions. And I'm sort of reviewing here the kinds of things that we've talked about. I didn't talk about clocks much, but if you want to, I will. Uh, we've talked about radiative forces, the dipole force and the scattering force. And we've talked about the dressed atom picture for understanding uh, how the dipole force arises. And uh, so if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to stop here and answer them. Now, I know that a lot of people sometime, sometimes are reluctant to ask a question because they think, well, gee, I don't quite understand this, but I think I ought to understand it. And so I'm not going to ask the question because question. Then everybody will think I don't understand. And you should never think that way because everybody is thinking the same way. Yes, Vanderlei, question. Uh, I think we understood from you that uh, wherever atoms absorb light, it gets a force, which is the recoil of yes. the photon that's absorbed. And then when there is a gradient of intensity, we have uh, another type of force because uh, uh, the, the atom is like a dipole. And then uh, there is an interaction on the presence of the light being or not being in resonance. Now, I want to imagine the following situation, and I want to see what you think. When I absorb a photon, I am creating in the light field a kind of gradient because uh, before the <laughs> atoms, there was photon, after that is not. So yes. in, uh, there is a kind of, the, the, let's say, the spontaneous force also creates a gradient. Is there yes. a way to somehow make a uniform thinking about both forces? Yeah, so, no, that's, that's an extremely a uh, good and deep question, and one that I think is still not fully understood. So the treatment that I've given basically assumes that the atoms are so uh, dilute that they do not change the, uh, the light field. But as we well know, that's not always the case. And very recently, there have been some experiments in which just the kind of force that you're describing uh, has been uh, shown to exist on a dense cloud of atoms with a plane wave uh, illuminating it. And because the atoms do exactly what you say, uh, absorb the light, uh, that it creates a kind of a dipole force. But the trouble is that at least the last time that I looked, nobody had yet come up with a full theory for understanding exactly how this, uh, um, uh, how this uh, force should be understood. But I think everyone believes that it's a manifestation of the dipole force, but uh, it still isn't fully understood in the sense that that, that uh, we have a really good calculation. But it's um, so it's kind of amazing that this far into the study of laser cooling, there are still uh, aspects of it that we don't understand theoretically.
Hi, Bill. Is Emerson? I think you. Hi. <laughs> and you know me. Uh, I don't have a, a question like this because I know the answer, but I would like you to just uh, briefly, maybe, since you change from uh, the uh, force that the atoms receive by radiative force, and soon you explain about the dipole force. Um, can you just explain me, or just explain a little bit more, if the atoms will not observe also uh, when you trap them in the dipole trap, for example, if they are still ah, observing photons? Right. Exactly. Very, very good point. So, so I'm glad you asked that. That's that's a really good point. The um, uh, I, I should have a, a slide about this, but I don't know where it is. So, when the atoms are in the dipole trap, they do in fact absorb photons. But what we try to do is to make the, the, uh, the laser so far off resonance that the rate at which they absorb photons is so small that we can ignore it. Now, why is this possible? It's because as we detune the laser from resonance, the rate at which um, the atoms absorb photons, and maybe I can, can come up with a... Uh, a slide that uh, that has that in it, the rate at which okay here we go. The, if so, if I increase the detuning delta, the rate at which I absorb photons decreases like one over delta squared. But the dipole force. Let's see if I come back to the dipole force here. Uh, the dipole force, uh, or the potential, goes like one over delta not one over delta squared. So you see that as I detune the, the laser further and further from resonance, both forces go down, but the scattering force goes down faster. And so I can, if I've got enough laser power, because I've got to compensate for, for the weakening of the dipole force by increasing the laser power, if I've got enough laser power, I detune more, I increase the laser power, I keep the, the trap the same depth while the scattering rate is going down. So that's how we make a, a trap that is basically uh, a, um, a conservative trap. Thanks for that question. Okay, Bill, you can go on. Okay, okay let's keep going. So now let's go to the idea of laser cooling. The idea uh, came in 1975. These were the people who separately came up with it, Weinland and Daymelt at the University of Washington, Hench and Shallow at Stanford. And here's the idea. Uh, I've got some atoms. Uh, this is a one-dimensional model. Uh, in this model, this is a gas of atoms. Some of the atoms are going to the right, some to the left. And I shine a laser beam on the atoms, and the laser beam is tuned below the resonant frequency. Now, because of the Doppler shift, if I think about this atom moving, whoops, moving toward this laser beam, it'll see the laser beam uh, Doppler shifted up in frequency, but the laser beam had been tuned below the resonant frequency. So that means that this atom, because of the Doppler shift, sees this laser beam as being closer to its resonant frequency. And so it's more likely to absorb photons because it's closer to resonance. This atom, on the other hand, is moving away from the laser beam and the Doppler shift makes it seem that the frequency of this laser is lower and it was already below the resonant frequency. So this atom will not absorb light as much uh, because of the Doppler effect. So this atom will absorb lots of light and slow down because of the, the radiation pressure force. This atom will absorb less light. It'll speed up a little bit, but not, not as much as this one slows down. Now, you make it work even better by bringing in uh, uh, another laser beam from the other side. So now this atom sees this laser beam as having the, the frequency close to its resonant frequency. It slows down a lot. This atom sees this one as being close to its resonant frequency, so it slows down a lot. So both atoms are slowed down by the action of these laser beams, 
even though it's the same frequency laser beam just coming in from different directions. And it works just fine when I add laser beams coming from top and bottom and backwards and front. Uh, so now, the uh, uh, no matter which way the atoms go, they uh, they absorb light from the laser beams that are opposing their motion, and so they all cool down. And this is what we call laser cooling. And I do want to mention that every one of these people who in 1975 came up with this idea, every one of those people won a Nobel Prize since then for something else. So that gives you some idea of how smart these guys were, that this was not even the, uh, the most important thing that they did. <laughs> now, along with that laser cooling is, as there always is in physics, there is a heating process that happens at the same time. Uh, you can never avoid heating uh, if you have cooling by dissipation. The fluctuation dissipation theorem guarantees it. Where does that heating come from? It comes from the fact that the absorption of the light and the emission of the light are random processes. The number of photons that an atom absorbs during any, any given amount of time is given on average by the, um, uh, the, the expression that I wrote down for what the absorption rate is, but the actual number in any given time interval is going to fluctuate. Uh, it'll have an approximately Poisson distribution. Uh, and when you radiate the, the photons, every photon absorbed is going to get radiated, but the radiation is in a random direction. So that means that the direction in which the atom is kicked is random, and the amount by which the atom is kicked in any given amount of time is also a random function around some average value. So the, that randomness gives the atom kicks that are uh, stochastic, that are, that, are, that are random, and the cooling process is trying to reduce the, the motion. The random kicks are heating the atoms, and so there's a balance between heating and cooling, and that leads to what we call the Doppler limit. And this is the Doppler limit. This is the lowest temperature you can expect by this process, that Boltzmann's constant times that temperature is always going to be greater than or equal to the energy corresponding to the line width, uh, that is the range of uh, frequencies over which the, uh, the atom absorbs light, divided by two. And for sodium, which was the first atom that we, we did this on, that number is 240 microkelvins. That's a really, really low temperature. The thermal velocity corresponding to that temperature in any given direction is about 30 centimeters per second. Whereas if you heat up uh, uh, a sample of sodium to get uh, uh, a gas of, of sodium, the typical velocity of those atoms is going to be hundreds of meters per second. So this was one of the reasons why people got really interested in the idea of laser cooling. Uh, and started working on it. And here's a picture from our laboratory from the uh, the 1980s when we finally succeeded in doing uh, laser cooling. Uh, and um, uh, what we have here is laser beams coming in from along uh, the, the various coordinate directions. And here in the center where they intersect, the atom's motion is so strongly damped by the cooling process that the atoms hang around for a really long time and that this bright uh, uh, region that you see here is where uh, the atoms are being laser cooled uh, in all directions. This is about a centimeter across and there's about 100 million atoms there. And um, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, uh, I'm taking longer than I had hoped to do this, so I'm going to skip a few things. So you're probably going to be happy that I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll, I won't skip this. Imagine that I've just got one laser beam coming from the left, so it's going to exert a force in the positive direction on every atom. And here's what the force looks like as a function of the velocity of the atoms. If the atom is moving in the negative direction and the Doppler shift just cancels out the detuning, that's when you're going to get the maximum force. And if the atom is going at some other velocity, you get a smaller force. Now, if we add the uh, laser beam from the other direction, that's going to add a negative force, and that's this curve. 
and it has the same sort of uh, uh, of shape, except now in order to maximize the force in that direction, I need to be going in the positive direction in order to maximize the negative force. So the atom is going to see the sum of these two forces. So here's what that sum looks like. You see, over a pretty wide range of velocities around zero, we have a force that is proportional to the velocity and in the opposite direction of the velocity. This is very much like viscosity. If I have a an object in a viscous fluid, uh, then the force uh, of viscosity uh, is proportional to the velocity. And that's one of the reasons why we call this optical molasses, because the atoms feel as if they're in a viscous fluid. Now what I'm going to do is uh, not uh, go through all the algebra, uh, which is rather significant, but easy to do. This is all high school algebra uh, for calculating exactly what that uh, force is. And uh, I'm also going to uh, not go through all the algebra that calculates what the fluctuations of the force are. Uh, I've already told you that uh, it comes from two different things. It comes from the fluctuation in the number of photons absorbed, and it comes from fluctuations in the direction of the photons. This was not all that well understood at the very beginning, but eventually people worked it out. And I'm not going to go through the algebra that balances those two things uh, together uh, to see what the final uh, velocity uh uh, distribution of the atoms is, but simply show you what the result is. This is the temperature of the atoms as a function of the detuning. So it minimizes when the detuning of the laser is half a line width off resonance. Now that's not very surprising because that's the place where you've got a very strong change in the scattering rate as you change the velocity. And it's that change in the scattering rate as you change the velocity that is responsible for the laser cooling. So that's where you're going to get the lowest temperature. If you go to bigger detunings or smaller detunings, the temperature goes up. So this is where the lowest temperature is supposed to be. And, uh, and that lowest temperature is given by KT equals H bar gamma over 2. Now, let me just make a comment about optical molasses. One of the reasons we call it optical molasses is that it has this high viscosity. But the other reason is that the motion of the atoms in the optical molasses is diffusive. That is, the atoms can't go very far before their velocity is turned around by the laser cooling process and the atoms are now going in some other random direction. So it's not that atoms have some low velocity and they go through the laser beams. No, they stay in the laser beams for a really long time because they keep bouncing around. And uh, uh, that viscous confinement uh, was one of the main reasons why it was called optical molasses by Steve Chu uh, when it was first observed in his laboratory. But lots of times people don't think about that feature. So let's stop here and see if anybody has any questions about uh, either the concept of Doppler cooling, which I've given you now, the way in which uh, heating happens due to momentum uh, diffusion, or how we calculate the equilibrium temperature. Question? There's one. It's a lecture, right? It's not a <laughs> seminar or a colloquium. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I would like to um, ask you how this is like translated to the experimental uh, scenery because I can understand the theory, but I I am not visualizing how can you really measure this in the lab. Like I I saw the photo, but it's a bit confusing for me. And also about the equilibrium temperature because I didn't understand a bit about the velocity of the yeah. sodium atoms. So I would okay. like to. Oh, okay. So let me say a little bit about how, uh, how this is done in the laboratory. First of all, it has to be in a vacuum, as you can probably imagine. So we, we have a, a stainless steel vacuum chamber and uh, we pump it down so that the, the vacuum is I'm not sure if you're familiar with these kinds of units, but uh, in a really good vacuum, 
what we're looking for is something like 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 11 tor. So this is a re really good vacuum. And, what, and the reason we want such a good vacuum is we don't want any stray background gas atoms hitting our laser-cooled atoms because if they do, it's just going to knock them uh, out of our experiment. So we, ha we, we, we have a very good vacuum. We've got windows, uh, transparent windows, all over the vacuum system so we can shine laser beams in and we can uh, look at the atoms using cameras. So, for example, the picture that I showed you was actually taken with film, but uh, that's because it was such a long time ago. Today, we use uh, digital cameras, video cameras uh, frequently to take pic pictures of our atoms. Um, and so we shine laser beams through these windows. Uh, we have a gas of atoms. Um, in, a, in a little bit, I'm going to tell you about how we get the, uh, the atoms cold enough to begin with so that we can shine the laser beams on them. But just imagine that I've got some atoms that are in my vacuum system, say sodium atoms, which is the first atom we use. And now I shine these laser beams in and that produces that picture that uh, that I showed you in the um, earlier in the lecture. Uh, it's right here. Uh, uh, those those laser beams came in from windows from the outside, and outside there is a big table on which we've got uh, lots and lots of lasers and mirrors and lenses and uh, uh, polarizers to manipulate these laser beams to, to do just the right thing. And then we send them, uh, by manipulating these mirrors and lenses, we send them into the vacuum system, and uh, when there's some sodium atoms hanging around, then those sodium atoms atoms when they get to this place of intersection they stick because the molasses is so sticky they stick and that's why we see it so bright right there now the other question you asked was about uh about the temperature so let's go back to uh let's go back to here so now if an atom has a velocity this way it feels a force in it in opposing it. If it has a velocity that way, it feels a force uh, opposing its motion. And uh, the average force that it sees is this thing that is always in a direction opposite to, to the way it's moving. So that's where, where this comes in. F equals minus alpha times V. Just because of the, of the way that uh, when I sum together the force coming from the right and the force coming from the left, I'm going to get this thing that at least near the velocity equals zero is, is linear. Okay, so now let's say that I've got something with some velocity and it experiences this force. That force is going to reduce its velocity with a certain time constant, right? Um, uh, force, remember Newton's law? Force is ma. So the force is equal to the mass times the derivative, the time derivative of the velocity. So that's what I've got on this side of the equation. Mass times time derivative of the velocity is equal to some constant that's negative times the velocity. Well, what's this going to do? It's just going to slow it down to zero if that's all there was. But that's not all there is. And, and the time, by the way, in which this happens is microseconds. This happens really fast. But that's not all there is. There's also this randomness. This, this force is not the whole story. That's just the average force. There's also these fluctuations. And anytime you have fluctuations, you're going to have heating. Think of it this way. You've probably heard of the idea of a random walk. The idea of a random walk is you start at a certain location and then you take a step in one direction or the other at random. Let's say you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you go to the right, and if it's tails, you go to the left. Now, let's say you flip the coin 10,000 times. How, where are you going to be? Well, on average, when you calculate this out, you're going to be about 100 steps away from the center. Now, you have no idea which direction, and it's only on average about 100 steps, but you are not going to be at where you started because of the randomness of this process. Now, if those steps you take are steps of momentum, then you see that after a certain amount of time, your momentum has increased. You don't know to what, but you know on average what the square of the momentum is, and it's going to be equal to how many steps you took. 
and that's heating because the square of momentum is equal to kinetic energy. So that increases the thermal kinetic energy. So those are the things that go into uh, the calculation that I didn't give you uh, uh, because I was uh, realizing that I'm taking too much time, but I'm really happy that you asked that question because it, I hope, reveals what's uh, behind all of this. By the way, this is just what Einstein did in 1905 to uh, explain how Brownian motion works. And uh, so uh, uh, we're in good company with Einstein. Okay, the, the, so... They're going I, to have... Uh, uh... Part of the course is in the lab, Bill. So they're going to see in real Wonderful. life this. Okay. Wonderful. And you'll see this forest of, of optical mounts on this table. And you're wondering, how did anybody ever figure out where all those things should go? And the answer is, that's what you will do if you, if you get into this business. <laughs> okay, okay, Bill, you can go on. Okay, great. And don't so, worry about the time. We can go off few minutes after, okay? A few minutes, but not too many minutes, right? Okay. No, a so, few, like 15, 20, as you want. Okay, so here's what the cooling force looks like as a function of velocity. I've drawn this for a sodium atom, and if the sodium atom has a velocity of, of three meters per second, uh, and I've detuned the laser to optimize the force, then this is what the force looks like as a function of velocity. That at three meters per second is very big, pushing the uh, the sodium atom in the opposite direction. And if I go to really big velocities, the force is essentially zero. Now, if I heat up a gas of sodium atoms, most of the atoms are gonna be going at a few hundred meters per second, so they're way out here. They are not gonna feel this laser cooling force in any significant way. So what do we do? And the answer is we've got to start with an, an atomic beam and slow down the atomic beam. So here we have an oven. We heat it up to, you know, a few hundred degrees C. Uh, the sodium vaporizes, comes out through a hole in the oven. We have a little screen here that has a, another hole in it. So we have this, what we call a collimated beam going along here at a few hundred meters per second. And we shine a laser beam in the opposite direction to slow these atoms down because they're going way too fast uh, for us to uh, use this process that I've, that I've described. Now, here's the problem. If I shine that laser beam in to that atomic beam, that atomic beam in the first experiments, the atoms were going on average about a thousand meters per second, but with a huge spread of velocities, like plus or minus 500 meters per second. So the problem is that if you shine light in, doesn't matter what the frequency is, it'll pick out a certain tiny fraction of the atoms, the one that's, that have just the right Doppler shift to be resonant with this laser beam. Those atoms will absorb light, they'll slow down, and as soon as they've slowed down by a few meters per second, they will not feel much of a force anymore, and they'll stop slowing down. So if you do this, you will slow down a tiny fraction of the atoms by uh, a tiny fraction of their velocity. And that is not something that's useful to do. So here's the trick. Uh, we make a, um, a solenoid. We wind coils around a, uh, a core here. So we have more coils up here. That's why I've drawn it fatter here. And uh, the magnetic field is along this direction. And the, magnetic, and, and the magnetic field is lower here and it's higher here. And so the magnetic field looks like this. It's high right here at the, uh, the place where I've got uh, lots and lots of windings. And it declines as I go to the other end where I have fewer windings. So here's the magic. Uh, the atoms are coming out of this source and they've got a wide range of velocities. You shine in a laser, it has a certain frequency and it's resonant with some particular velocity of the atoms. Let's say the, the velocity at which most of the atoms are. Those atoms will absorb the light, they will slow down, but not much, and they will move into a place in the in the the solenoid where the magnetic field is a little bit lower and that means that the zeeman shift the shift of the energy levels of the atom due to the magnetic field will change and if we design this magnet just right 
that change in the Zeeman shift will compensate for the change in the Doppler shift, and the atoms will keep absorbing light. And if we make the shape just right, they'll continue to absorb light all the way down to the end. And all those atoms that had lower velocities will start absorbing light when they come to wherever in the, the solenoid has the right magnetic field. And in this way, I can get about half of the atoms cooled all the way down to just a few meters per second. And then the process that I've already described to you works, and I can cool the atoms down to, uh, we hope, a temperature as low as 240 microkelvin. Now, how do you measure a temperature that is that cold? Well, here's the first way that was devised by Steve Chu at Bell Labs. He turns on the molasses, uh, gets some atoms in here. Um, uh, so now you've got these atoms here in the optical molasses, and they're being sort of held there. They're not trapped, but they don't go very far because of the stickiness of the molasses. Then you turn the laser beams off. Now what happens is the atoms just expand uh, freely with whatever velocities they had at the time that you turn the laser beams off. And a few milliseconds later, you turn the laser beams on again, and whatever atoms are still in the region where the laser beams intersect, you will recapture. That is, they'll be stuck again. And by looking at the difference in the number of atoms here to the number of atoms here, you can tell what the temperature is. So they did that at Bell Labs, and Sure enough, they found that the temperature was 240 microkelvin. And we did it a little bit later, and in exactly the same way, got the temperature was 240 microkelvins, which is, if you remember, the lowest temperature that you can have according to the Doppler cooling uh, scheme. Well, then we did some other measurements, and it wasn't working out. It wasn't behaving the way we expected it to, and we started to say, look, maybe we should measure the temperature more carefully. So we did that, but we did it in a better way because you notice there's a big uncertainty here. So we wanted a smaller uncertainty. So what we did was we put a probe laser down below where the optical molasses is. We allowed the atoms to drop after turning off the optical molasses. And then by looking at the distribution of arrival times from this time of flight method, as it's called, we could determine what the temperature was. And here is the results. This is what the, the time of flight distribution should have been if the temperature was what the theory said. And this is what the, the distribution really was. And the, uh, the gray curve, that is the dots, are what the distribution really was. And the gray curve is what um, we would have expected if the temperature was 40 microkelvin, six times lower than the predicted temperature. So what we were finding out was that the temperature was a whole lot lower than what the theory said was possible. Now, how is that possible? And the answer is the theory was incomplete. The theory assumed that we had two level atoms, and we did not. So Dalibar and Cohen Tanuji in uh, Paris, Steve Chu and his colleagues at that time he'd moved to Stanford, came up with a new theory that took into account the fact that they weren't two level atoms. Now I'm going to skip over the discussion of, uh, uh, of why it works. Uh, let me just tell you, it's beautiful. Uh, the idea that the complexity of the atoms, the fact that the atoms have more than, uh, than a ground state and an excited state, leads to this incredibly beautiful process uh, that I'm not telling you about now. Uh, in which the atoms cool by a process that is far more efficient, far more uh, effective, uh, and so the atoms get to a much lower temperature. And then by um, understanding how uh, this process actually works, we were able to get to even lower temperatures. So unlike um, the... Uh, uh, the Doppler cooling process, which I described before, when we tune the laser further from resonance, the atoms get colder. They keep getting colder. Uh, there's a, a different heating mechanism that operates that dominates the, uh, uh, the process. Uh, and, and we end up with uh, a much stronger uh, cooling force, and we end up with a much lower temperature. 
Uh, and we get that low temperature by detuning the laser further from resonance and by turning the intensity down. The, the old Doppler cooling said that turning down the intensity doesn't change the temperature when you go to low intensities. But the new way says you do get to lower temperatures. So here's the new force as a function of velocity. This is the Doppler cooling force, okay, the one we've seen before. And now this is the new force, what we call the, the Sisyphus cooling force. And you see it's got a much stronger force versus velocity, and that's what leads to the lowest, uh, the lowest temperatures. And the temperatures get really, really cold. Cesium atoms, which should have a temperature of about um, 140 microkelvin, uh, cool down to less than one microkelvin. Uh, using this new process, which we discovered accidentally. Uh, the velocity of cesium atoms at that temperature um, is less than a centimeter per second. This is the recoil velocity, and it turns out that this process always leads to temperatures, if you operate at the, at the extreme uh, uh, conditions, always leads to temperatures temperatures that are a little bit higher than uh, the temperature implied by the recoil velocity. So we end up with cesium atoms moving at less than uh, a centimeter per second at a temperature less than one microkelvin when they should be 140 microkelvin, and this made all the difference in the world. Uh, so for example, today, cesium clocks uh, form the, uh, the time standards for the entire world. Uh, all of the, the big countries use cesium clocks as their time standards. They report their results to the International Bureau of Time. And uh, the most important contributions to that are using laser-cooled cesium atoms. And this is what keeps time for the whole world. So now, uh, uh, just so that we can get done, because I did that last little bit so superficially that I imagine it's hard to formulate questions. I'm just going to spend the last few minutes talking about Bose-Einstein condensation because that's what the whole idea of this, this short course that you're taking is. And uh, uh, we get to Bose-Einstein condensation starting with laser cooling, but ending up with something else. So what is Bose-Einstein condensation? In about 1924, Einstein predicted that if you had a gas of bosons, bosons being things like sodium atoms or rubidium atoms, and if the gas were, were cold enough and dense enough, something really strange would happen, which we now call Bose-Einstein condensation. Why do we call it Bose-Einstein condensation? Because Einstein figured it out using the new quantum statistics that Bose had just figured out. So uh, so both of their names get attached to it. It was Einstein who figured out the process, but it was Bose who figured out this statistical feature that makes these atoms bosons. And we're going to talk about what that is in just a moment. Now, Bose-Einstein condensation is a phase transition. And the nature of the phase transition is that a large fraction of the atoms stop moving. Now, when Einstein figured this out, he didn't yet know about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which tells us that they cannot stop moving. Because, of course, if you know where the atoms are, and we do because we put them in a trap, then you can't know exactly what their velocity is. And so they have to have a spread of velocity. And that's what happens, is that they go into the lowest possible state of motion consistent with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But when Einstein figured it out, he was he, he figured that the atoms would stop moving because he wasn't taking into account the idea of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So that's what Bose-Einstein condensation is. So what are bosons? Well, as you may already know, there are only two kinds of particles in the world, fermions and bosons. Fermions are half integral spin particles like electrons and protons and neutrons, as well as some atoms like deuterium, lithium-6, and the thing about fermions is that they follow the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle says that it is forbidden to have two fermions of the same type in the same quantum state. So in a certain sense, they are the loners of the quantum world. You, uh, you never have two fermions together in the same quantum state. They always want to be alone. 
And it's a really good thing because if it were not true that electrons followed this kind of a rule, uh, then uh, we wouldn't have chemistry because all electrons would be in the lowest energy state and chemistry would not be complex enough for us to exist. So it's a good thing that electrons are fermions. Now, what about bosons? Bosons are ones that have integral spin. Now, what do I mean by half integral and integral spin? I mean that the momentum, the angular momentum of fermions um, is half integral in units of h-bar, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So fermions have h-bar over 2, 3h bar over 2, 5h bar over 2, whereas bosons have 0 or h bar or 2h bar uh, units of angular momentum. Angular momentum is quantized in units of h bar. So what are things that are bosons? Photons, hydrogen atoms, lithium-7 atoms, sodium-23, rubidium-87, cesium-133, the isotope of cesium we use for clocks. And the thing about bosons is that they love to be in the same state. And if it wasn't true of photons, we wouldn't have lasers. Uh, and if it wasn't true of sodium and rubidium and similar atoms, we wouldn't have Bose condensates. So, um, uh, Vanderlei, can I stop sharing so that people can see me? Because I want to illustrate why bosons like to be together based oh, on the we idea are of seeing of... you you are not oh. you know you oh, are not okay. seeing oh, yourself oh, okay. okay i can't see myself but you can see me so what i'm going to do we is... are seeing you on the screen okay excellent i'm going to take away my uh my virtual background so oh, that it's okay. easier for me to make this demonstration okay here i have two cards now i hope you can see that they're different they're just actually the front and back of the same card. But the point is that they're different. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, now what I want to ask is, how many ways can I put these two cards into my two hands? I'm not going to ask for any of the details. I'm just going to say I got two cards in my left hand, or I have two cards in my right hand, or I have one card in my left hand and one card in my right hand, and the other way around. Okay, those are the four ways that I can hold two cards in two hands, right? Now, of those ways, four ways, two of them have the cards in the same hand, right? Now, let's imagine that instead of the cards being different, they're identical. So now there's this way, both cards in the left hand, this way, both cards in the right hand, one card in the right hand, one card in the left hand. And now you might say, well, what about if I switch them? This is where Bose comes up with his genius ID. He says, that's not a different state. Because these things are indistinguishable, and by indistinguishable mean there's absolutely no way, even in principle, telling them apart. Now, that's not true of these cards. If I were to weigh them, I'd find that they were slightly different weight. Uh, there's fingerprints on one and not on the other. So these cards are not identical, but photons are, rubidium atoms are. And so this is not the same as that. So, so there's, it's not different from that. The, this and this are the same thing. So there's only three ways of putting these cards into my two hands. This way, this way, and this way. And out of those three ways, two of them have the card in the same hand. That's the substance of why bosons like to be together. It's a purely statistical feature. It's not because they attract each other. It's just because of the way we count states when things are completely uh, indistinguishable. Okay, so how cold and how dense do you have to be? Remember I said that this phase transition happens when uh, you're cold enough and dense enough. Well, you remember from quantum mechanics that uh, everything is both a particle and a wave. So if I think of these atoms as particles and also as waves, when the temperature is high and when the density is low, the wavelength is very short and the distance between them is big. But if I lower the temperature, then the velocity of the atoms is going to be smaller 
and the wavelength is going to be bigger. That's the nature of the de Broglie wavelength. It's equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So if I make the temperature lower, that means the velocity, the thermal velocity is going to be lower, and the wavelength is going to be bigger. And if I get more atoms in the same place, then they're going to be closer together. And when the atoms are close enough together that they're within a wavelength of the other atoms, that's the place where we have this phase transition. That's what Einstein predicted. Now, the trouble is that laser cooling gets you close, but not close enough. Uh, the problem is that uh, we can get the, the temperature down to the temperature corresponding to the recoil temperature, that is, or uh, a little bit higher than that, that is, the, the temperature where the thermal velocity is about equal to the recoil velocity, the recoil velocity being the velocity that you recoil with when you hit the atom with one photon. Uh, and the density turns out not to be able to be gotten much bigger than about 10 to the 11th per cubic centimeter, because when you get the density bigger than that, the atoms start colliding with, with each other in a way that uh, heats them up. So what happens is that um, uh, you have a pair of atoms, and they have uh, this uh, molecular potential uh, that, that says when the, the ground state and the excited state atom get close together, they attract each other. And so if I excite the atoms uh, so that they're on this ground state plus, plus excited state potential, they'll start to accelerate toward each other. Then they'll decay. And now the atoms are going really fast. And basically, I've destroyed my cold atom sample. And so if I get the density any higher than about 10 to the 11th, this starts to happen, and I can't get the density any higher because the atoms are gone. So the question is, how are we going to get colder and denser? And here's where a very simple idea comes in. It's called evaporation. You all know about evaporation. If you want to cool down your coffee, you blow on it. And what this does is it liberates water molecules from the surface, the ones that have the most kinetic energy. They leave, and what's left behind has less kinetic energy, which means it's colder. We do the same thing. We put the atoms in a trap. This is why it's so important to have a trap. We allow the most energetic of the atoms to escape from the trap. So we just adjust the trap depth so that those atoms can escape. And if what's left behind re-equilibrates, to produce a new thermal distribution, uh, then that, that colder gas is going to be held more tightly in the trap, so it's denser, and it's going to be colder, and that's the direction we want to go. And we can do this with a laser trap, we can do this with a magnetic trap, uh, we have to, to, to redesign our magnetic trap, but the point is that if we do this right, we can start with a laser-cooled gas of atoms that is several orders of magnitude too hot and too dilute to undergo Bose, Bose condensation, and we can cool it by this evaporation process enough that we can see Bose-Einstein condensation. And in 1995, more than 70 years after Einstein made this prediction, teams in Boulder, Colorado, and in Cambridge, Massachusetts, achieved Bose-Einstein condensation by first laser cooling the, the atoms, and then doing this evaporation cooling. And uh, for that, they got the 2001 Nobel Prize. And here are the, the heroes of Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, Eric Cornell uh, and Carl Williams working in Colorado. Uh, Wolfgang Ketterle uh, working at MIT in in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And here is a now famous series of pictures that shows the approach to Bose-Einstein condensation. Here is a two-dimensional velocity distribution for a gas of rubidium atoms at 400 nanokelvin. So this is already really, really cold. They've already been doing evaporative cooling, but it's still not cold enough. At 400 nanokelvin, they hadn't achieved a low enough temperature and a high enough density. So it's just a broad and featureless distribution, just like you'd expect from something like a Maxwell-Boltzmann gas. But this is not a Maxwell-Boltzmann gas. It's a Bose gas. And when they cool it just a little bit further, this great big peak 
comes up, and that's the Bose condensate. That's the the part of the gas that is essentially not moving. It's going at at, at a velocity uh, determined by the uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, in these pictures, there's some other things that make that velocity distribution a little bit broader, but um, the, the the simple story is that these uh, atoms are in the condensate and they are uh, at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle limit. Further cooling, that is further evaporation, gets rid of this broad uh, tail and you end up with something that looks like almost a pure condensate. This is, for many practical purposes, a gas at absolute zero. The little tiny fraction of atoms that are still in this tail are what tells you that it's not really at absolute zero. So uh, here's here's what happens. As I cool the temperature down, if I could keep the, 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 uh, the density constant, then I get to this critical temperature where the de Broglie wavelength is equal to the inner particle spacing approximately. And then all of a sudden, uh, a, a lot of atoms appear at uh, in the ground state of the trap. And that number increases and increases until it, at, at zero temperature, all the atoms, or almost all the atoms, are in what we call the condensate, are in this lowest energy um, uh, state of the trap. And for a, a harmonic trap in, in three dimensions, this is the, uh, is the functional form of that um, uh, 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 curve that shows the fraction of the atoms that are in the, uh, that are in the Bose condensate. Now, I want to emphasize some of the things that are so wonderful and strange about this, um, this process of Bose-Einstein condensation. This happens even if the atoms don't interact. Now, our atoms do interact, but that is not very important for seeing this, uh, uh, this transition. The transition is driven by quantum statistics, not by interactions. There was never any such thing that happened before. If you think about the kind of phase transitions we know, those phase transitions are all happening because of the interaction between the atoms. If I condense steam into water, it's because the water molecules stick together to form steam. Uh, that's not what's going on here. This is a phase transition that's due entirely to the nature of the quantum statistics, the ones invented by Bose. Uh, uh, another thing is that when the transition occurs, the gas does not fully convert into a, um, a Bose condensate. If I've got a gas of, of water vapor, let's say, and I cool the gas down, uh, when I get to the condensation temperature, it'll, it'll start to condense and it'll stay at the condensation temperature until everything is condensed and then I will go to lower temperature. And when I get down to the ice point, then uh, I'll stay at the ice point until it's all condensed into ice, and then I can go to lower temperatures. That's not the way this works. I get a, a, a varying fraction of the atoms in the in the condensate depending upon what the temperature is. So this is a phase transition that's that's different from the the kinds of phase transitions you've you've seen in the past. So now. Uh, why don't we uh, why don't we stop for some questions about anything that I've talked about um, uh, through the whole lecture? Uh, before I do that, let me just show you one thing. This is a logarithmic thermometer. That means every tick mark on the thermometer represents a factor of ten, just to show you how cold we get. The surface of the sun has a temperature of about six thousand degrees. Room temperature on this thermometer is just a tiny bit colder than the surface of the sun. And outer space, the coldest natural temperature we have in the universe, is uh, only a little bit colder than the surface of the sun itself. The first experiment for optical molasses that was 240 microkelvin, that turned out to still be way higher than what it is, is colder compared to the coldest natural temperature in the universe than that is compared to the surface of the sun. And that was just the beginning. So you see that same gap between the coldest temperature and the surface of the sun is about the same as what we finally got 
uh, atoms down to using the uh, the multi-state uh, laser cooling. And now we're way, way colder than that. Uh, in a drop tower where you can simulate microgravity for a few seconds, they've gotten down to temperatures of 38 picokelp. And we keep getting better and better. So this is the kind of thing that's going on. These things are really, really cold. So questions? Pedro. One of the Pedro have a lot of Pedros here. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I would like to know if we have a limit to the condensed fraction. Like, yeah. we slow down the temperature, but is there a limit for the yeah. condensed fraction? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, there's two features that are going to limit the condensate fraction. One is that we never get to absolute zero. <laughs> Uh, uh, the process by which we get to lower temperatures always leaves the door open for uh, uh, a little bit of non-zero temperature to happen. But that's not the main reason why our condensates are not pure condensates. The main reason is because they the atoms interact with each other. And that interaction creates... Um, uh, non-zero uh, momentum states in the gas, it turns out to be pretty small. So for our gases, it's pretty common for us to have a limit of about 1% of the gas not condensed as we go to absolute zero. Contrast this with liquid helium. So liquid helium is also a, uh, uh, a boson that is helium-4. If I've got a gas of helium-4, uh, those are also bosons, they condense into a liquid before they Bose condense into a superfluid liquid, but at about two degrees, they condense into a superfluid liquid, and it's because of the Bose statistics and because of Bose-Einstein condensation. But even at absolute zero, only 10% of the, uh, of the liquid, of the atoms in the Bose uh, liquid, are in the condensate. Oddly, they're 100% they're superfluid, <laughs> which is an interesting feature, but only 10% condensed. So our atomic gases are way better than liquid helium in that regard if you want to have your, your system all condensed. But it's not completely condensed, but the amount by which it's not condensed is pretty small. <laughs> Questions? I have one. Oh, you have one. Okay. Uh... Hi. I wanted to know what kind of research you do on the trapped atoms. Yeah, now. Well, so, so one of the main things that we're doing, and, and when I say it's not so much... Um, research that I do, because I'm, I'm an old guy now. All the good research is being done by the young people in our group. People like Gretchen Campbell and Ian Spielman and, and, uh, and Trey Porto and Paul that uh, are doing amazing things. So let me just give you one example that is being led by Gretchen Campbell. What she does, and I've been collaborating with her, and it's really been a great pleasure to collaborate with her on this. She makes a trap where the shape of the trap is a donut, a torus. And now she Bose condenses uh, a gas of sodium atoms into that torus. So now I've got a, a Bose condensate in the shape of a torus. And then she spins it up by putting another laser beam into that torus and, and stirring it around. Now, because it's a quantum fluid, it can't have just any velocity. It has to have a velocity that gives it uh, an angular momentum uh, of um, uh, that's quantized in h bar. <laughs> so, so you can't stir it to any velocity you want. You can only stir it to very specific velocities. And she can study the transition from one of those quantized velocity states to another quantized velocity state. And she can um, put in a barrier so the atoms have to tunnel through this barrier in order to flow around the, um, uh, 
uh, uh, the Taurus. And that thing acts as what we call a Joseph's injunction, which you'll learn about when you study more quantum mechanics, if you haven't already. And it just produces marvelous things that are the analogs of what superconductors do. So that's just one example of the kinds of experiments that we're doing that I think falls into a category of what we call quantum simulation. That is, we are using these cold atoms, which we understand really, really well, to uh, simulate the behavior of something like superconductors that we don't understand as well. And we're hoping that by doing this kind of thing, we'll get new insights into, into the way these more complex systems like superconductors or like electrons uh, moving in uh, in crystal lattices, that we can get insights into how those systems work that we uh, didn't have before by simulating those systems with atoms, cold atoms, that we understand better and that we can control better and that we can measure better. Okay. Well, there are also other applications of cold atoms, like better spectroscopy, understanding how atoms interact with each other. And Paul yes. Lettig spent part of his life, and we did it too, understanding yeah. collisions and everything. And Absolutely, that's right. <laughs> okay, I have so, one question from outside. Okay. And an uh, um, uh, outsider of the auditorium asked uh, what we gain by using cold atoms in clocks. Okay. So before I answer that question, which is a lovely question, I just want to also mention that one of the interesting things to do with Bose condensates is to study quantum turbulence. And right here in San Carlos is one of the places where the idea of studying quantum turbulence has been pioneered. So if you want to be in the, the place where it all started, and where it's still at the frontier of something, something totally, uh, totally new, quantum turbulence with Bose condensates right here in San Carlos. Okay, let's answer the question about atomic clocks. Okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, let's look at this. Okay, so here is a kind of a schematic a uh, picture of how an atomic clock works. So we imagine that we've got uh, an oven that has some cesium metal in it. We heat it up. Uh, uh, it vaporizes. The atoms come out. We have a screen with a little hole, just like I showed you before, for uh, an atomic beam. And we state select those atoms. We imagine, again, that the, the cesium atom is a two-level atom. And those two levels are what we call hyperfine states. It corresponds to Roughly speaking, it corresponds to the relative orientation of the electron spin relative to the nuclear spin. And those two states are separated by an energy that corresponds to about 9.2 gigahertz. So we state selected so all of the atoms are in uh, the ground state. We send it through a microwave cavity that's fed by microwave radiation at this frequency. The microwave cavity puts the atoms into a superposition of these two states. That superposition uh, cranks away uh, until we get to the other cavity. And depending upon the phase of the microwaves relative to the phase of the superposition, then that next step will either put the atom into the excited state or into the ground state or into some... Uh, a uh, fraction of atoms in the excited state or the ground state, and then we detect it. <clears throat> so if the frequency of the uh, microwaves is exactly the frequency of the atoms, then what will happen is the atoms will change to the excited state, and I can detect that. Now, as I change the frequency of the microwaves, I change how many atoms are in the excited state. And the width of that resonance, that is, What's the range of frequencies over which I go from uh, having, say, half the atoms in the excited state to all the atoms in the excited state to half the atoms in the excited state when I go uh, uh, too high in frequency? That width is proportional to one over the time it takes the atoms to go from here to here. So if I can make that time longer, I make that width smaller and I can do a better job. That's probably the most important thing. Now, um, 
it's not quite as simple as what I've shown you, because if I really made the atoms go at one centimeters per second, which is what we do do, we make the atoms go at one centimeter per second, then I could not put them into an atomic clock like this because they would just drop like rocks. Because so so let's say that I I I had our atoms and here's the two cavities and they're going on at 100 meters per second. They go like that. But if I were to uh, have them go at one centimeter per second, they would just drop. And so what we do instead is we shoot them up through a microwave cavity. And they come back down after about a second instead of after a few milliseconds. And that's how we make the atomic clock work. And we've got to have a low temperature because if we didn't, for one thing, uh, uh, we'd probably never get them in the cavity in the first place, but uh, uh, they just wouldn't make it back through the cavity. So we have to have these atoms at a, at a temperature of about a microkelvin. And that's what they're doing here in this apparatus. They cool cesium atoms to a microkelvin here. They shoot them up in a vacuum. They come back down after a second and they get a, a performance at about a part in 10 to the 16. Now, that time for observation is probably the most important thing, but it's not the only thing. Doppler shifts. Remember that when an atom is moving, the, the frequency that it sees when it's, say, looking at the microwaves, is going to be Doppler shifted. Now, we got all kinds of tricks to get rid of that by making the microwaves go in both directions and balancing them very carefully, but these tricks don't work perfectly. And so, in order to do better, we need to make the atoms go more slowly. Another feature that's really important is that um, uh, we have a relativistic, a special relativity time dilation. Einstein taught us that moving clocks run slow and the atoms are moving clocks and they uh, have a pretty big relativistic time dilation for the kinds of, of velocities that ordinary thermal cesium atoms have. We can essentially get rid of that by making the cesium atoms go so slowly. So those are the ways in which making the atoms go slowly help atomic clocks. Um, Professor Phillips, um, I am the youngest here in the room, I guess. From all the students here, I'm, I am the youngest. I am only 20 years old. My name is Carla Melissa. And before we finish, I just wanted to say, you know, as we know, it's not the first time you come here. You come here oftenly, but I'll throw that. Uh, something important is that there will always be, there are now, and there will always be, People, students here that are hearing you, hearing you in person for the first time, you know. So the importance of the moment of the space we are having here and the importance of the time you are spending here with us now, it's always the same and the honor will be always the same as the first time you came here because for some of us or most of us, like, like now, it will be the first time we are hearing you. So I just wanted to say thank you, but at this time, in name of all the students here. Well, thank you very much. That's that's extremely kind of you. And I hope that the main thing that you get out of this interaction is how exciting it is to do physics. <laughs> thank you, Carla. Carla is one of the students. As I told you, they are all undergraduates. Some of them are younger, right? She's the youngest of the group. And uh, the director of our institute, send the, by the chat here. Uh, thank you, Professor Phillips, for the fantastic lecture. It was an hour, an honor and privilege having you at the Institute of Physics of São Carlos, even virtually this time. Thank you very much. Bill, thank you for the lecture. And I hope uh, when you see, we should pay your lecture. So you know. <laughs> In Brazil, there are many ways to prepare açaí. You can have <laughs> yeah. açaí with milk. You can have açaí with guaraná. You can have açaí with fruits. You can have açaí with granola. And then uh, when you come next semester for a special event and visiting us, uh, each day 
you have the right to claim for a special açaí uh, in one of the Brazilian forms. Thank you very well, much, Bill, and it was a pleasure to have you. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to be with you, and I remember that somewhere in San Carlos is a restaurant where everything on the menu involves açaí. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thank you very much for your time, and uh, hope to see you next week in the chat and everything. Yes. Okay, Bill, bye-bye. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.